All right. Welcome, everyone, to what is the name of our talk, really? Navigating the Processing Unit Landscape in Kubernetes for AI Use Cases. Um, so today we're going to be talking about processing units. We'll go over the basics of what they are. And then we're going to talk about how they're used in Kubernetes, especially in AI and ML workloads. I'm Kaslyn Fields. I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud, where I focus on GKE and open source Kubernetes. I'm also a co-chair of the Special Interest Group for Contributor Experience in open source Kubernetes. So if you have any questions about contributing, feel free to let me know. Um, I'm also a CNCF ambassador and a co-host of the Kubernetes podcast from Google. And my name is Mofi. I am also a developer advocate at Google focusing on GKE. And these days, my focus mostly is around running AI workload on Kubernetes. And hello, everyone. I'm Rob Koch. I'm a principal at Solemn Build. I'm also an AWS data hero. So sorry, in between amongst two Googlers here, but uh, I also work um, uh, in the uh, CNCF uh, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group. I am the co-chair here, and I'd like to welcome uh, the rest of the group here that's uh, supporting me today. All right, folks. We're going to start off with some heavy stuff. I'm going to tell you the truth about containers. Did you know that you can write containers in like 100 lines of bash? <laughs> containers really are primarily made up of a couple of core Linux kernel components called C groups and namespaces. C groups allow you to do resource sharing. So you've got so much CPU, you've got so much memory on your machine. Using a C group, you can say, this process gets this much of the processor and gets this much of the memory. The other core component is namespaces. And namespaces are a logical environmental isolation mechanism. So they're a way of separating processes from one another. And aside from that, a container is basically just a process. And that's going to come into play a lot as we go through our content today. So let's start talking about processing units. There are a whole bunch of different types of processing units, actually. Not sure if you're aware, but <laughs> there are a whole bunch of them. They all end in PU because they're processing units. But today, we're going to be talking about them in the context of Kubernetes. So for a processing unit to be uh, compatible or supported by Kubernetes, it basically needs to be supported by uh, the Linux kernel. It needs to have a device driver that's compatible with Kubernetes and the hardware that Kubernetes works with and it needs to be supported by the Kubernetes scheduler. Finding all of these components can be pretty hard. There's nowhere in the docs that actually has all of this uh, written down. But basically, there are three main types that are supported, CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. And actually, FPGA is also supported in Kubernetes. And there's a talk going on right now <laughs> that is talking about FPGA in Kubernetes. So check out the recording of that later. Uh, that one is mainly used more in like personal use cases or on-prem use cases. It's not used in cloud environments, really. Um, so we won't be going into detail on that, but check out that other talk if you want to learn about it. So first up, we're going to talk about CPUs. So CPUs, uh, a lot of work is happening behind the scenes there. So it's working on looking through memory, reading from memory, writing from memory, and going on and on. There's crazy amounts of what's going on there. So for the general purpose use of CPUs, there's a lot of different things that you could um, do with it. You can write code to, and have it be processed there. And, continually improve on your speed of your messaging and all of that going through every day. So seeing um, many different things happening per second. But because of the billions of executions, there's not enough of, um, of those things happening, right? So we have multiple core CPUs for the purpose of processing more. And they can work in parallel at the same time, um, running all together. The CPUs also are receiving a lot of instruction and doing the basic math to create 3D avatars, maybe, or um, processing graphics that way. Um, maybe in eventually sign language, who knows? So you can see here this kind of process of setting up um, 
CPUs. It's basically a switch, like an on-off switch, like a one zero. And it tends to then go from there, writing in input to the processors, you can see here, and then it decides what's going to be done with it, with that set of instructions that's being passed. So then that gets written to memory. And then we go through the control plane to pick up whatever's there in the memory, process it, and then it keeps going and going and going to eventually getting to the output. So this is well and good, and processors, CPUs can do all sorts of general things, which is awesome in how our phones and computers generally work. Um, but there's one little problem. So the CPU is basically, as Rob said, either doing work or it's not doing work. And if it's not doing work, then it needs to go figure out what the next instruction is, and that's stored in the memory. So every time it has to go back to the memory to figure out what the next instruction is, that takes a lot of time and makes CPUs quite slow. And that's what we call the von Neumann bottleneck. So there's a way that we can adjust our architecture to make this at least a little bit faster. We can take the memory and instead of having it outside of the CPU, put it inside of the CPU. The closer it is, the faster it's going to be. So modern CPUs generally have multiple cores, and each one of those cores um, has some memory in it, an L1 and possibly an L2 cache. And there can also be an L3 cache within the multi-core CPU. So all of these different layers of memory are giving us faster and faster, or less fast and less fast, depending on which way you're looking at it, <laughs> memory that the CPU can access to make them feel faster. So when you think about how a CPU works, is like what we talked about, a CPU is constantly reading from memory what the next instruction needs to be and computing it. In this line of code, if you have a variable y equals to wx plus b, it has w and x and b stored in memory, so it will multiply w with x, add that to b, and then store the whole thing into y. If that thing is running in a loop, it had to constantly go back to see what is currently w, what is currently x, what is currently b in your memory. So. In the best case scenario, that thing is constantly running and the memory is very close in the L1 cache, but sometimes they are not because CPU also does other things in your computer. So if for some reason CPU looks at somewhere else or on other processes, it will have to go back and reload that uh, inf instruction back into its memory. So every time it goes and reads stuff from memory, this is a connection being happening over the memory that creates latency as well as produces heat to do that calculation over and over again. So in Kubernetes, there are a wide variety of CPUs that you can use. Um, there are, of course, single core CPUs, but we rarely see them these days, so I have it marked out here. Um, but generally these days, you'll see multi-core CPUs, and those multi-core CPUs can be architected in different ways themselves. So there are ARM CPUs and x86 and x64. We probably learned about these in school. Um, and Kubernetes supports a wide variety of these architectures. Here I've got an example of Kubernetes by Justin Garrison, um, which uses Intel processors and a Raspberry Pi cluster that Mofi made that uses ARM processors. So both kinds of CPUs work in Kubernetes. So now let's talk about the special type of accelerators that probably a lot of we are hearing in the last few months to a year, uh, GPUs. Before we talk about GPUs, why do we care about this kind of special hardware for AIML workload is a concept called embarrassingly parallel problems. So in computer science, there are a certain set of problems that can be computed the next iteration without looking at the previous iteration or other things that are running in parallel. And these are also called perfectly parallel or pleasantly parallel. Uh, I like the other terms other than embarrassingly parallel. It kind of makes me think there is something shameful about being parallel here, but in reality, those problems are really nice for us to be able to solve with multiple processors doing the work at the same time. So a GPU stands for a graphics processing unit. Uh, they actually have been around for a while now. They are initially created to process your, render your graphics from your video games or your computer monitor. And we use these things to speed up our frame rate on playing video games. But turns out, when you're doing things like machine learning workload, the actual task of computing the next uh, cycle on your neural network is very similar of you can do multiple of those things in parallel and compute that at the same time. So GPU works really nicely on that kind of workload. So the main concept here is a CPU has a very few really fast cores. Like we saw four core architecture, you can even buy up to 16 core for a consumer machine. In the cloud, you can even get up to a few hundred cores in a single VM. But what if we just did that, but put like a few thousand of them in the same machine? 
So we could get the fast speed of CPU and do the work in parallel across a few thousand of these cores. And that's exactly what they did for GPU. A single GPU usually have multiple processing clusters, so they put these cores in a single processing cluster. A processing cluster is made up of a bunch of streaming multiprocessor, also known as SMs, and each SM will have some L1 caches and L2 caches for the quick access to memory. The problem of going back to the memory for the next instru instruction is still a struggle for GPUs. To solve that problem, they use something called caches within the GPU architecture. And the whole processing cluster communicates with high bandwidth memory so that it can handle a large variety of large volume of data at the same time. So this would be probably a typical archetype of what a GPU structure would look like. The greens here are the actual cores that made a, makes up streaming processors, which combine to make up a processing cluster, which have a shared L2 cache in between, and each of the processors also have L1 cache for quicker memory access. And when the GPU needs to access hard, like uh, other data uh, but that's not in the cache, it will go to the memory controller to talk to GDDR uh, memory. On the latest iteration of GPUs, you're gonna see things like GDDR5 or GDDR6 memories, and each iteration of those memories are faster and faster, but also consumes a lot more energy to produce the information. And this is the same image, but for the NVIDIA H100. Now the second latest GPU from NVIDIA, like this slide became outdated in two days because NVIDIA had their GTC conference like in Monday. But NVIDIA 100, the same image that we saw here, now scaled up to a lot bigger because the H100 has a lot more of those green things at the cores and between each of them, you have the L1 caches, between them they have a L2 cache and two of those processing cluster together make up the H100. For the B200 that got announced like two days ago, the same structure now got scaled to twice this size, right? So we're making bigger and bigger, more and more cores into the same system to be able to handle more and more data. Now, the same task we saw for the CPU, the calculation of Y equals WX plus B, which by the way is a computation we usually do for MNIST, which is a model that can understand handwritten data set. So for Doing the same computation one core at a time, but now on the thousands of those cores, you can do the calculation parallelly across all of them and collect the information at the end of it that gives us the output at the same time. So the stuff that was happening, the computation time is probably a little bit slower because a single CPU core is probably faster than a single GPU core, but when you can have 5,000 of them working at the same time, your actual workload speeds up. Now let's talk about TPU. So TPUs, are specialized hardware built by Google Research for doing matrix computation. So TPU stands for Tensor Processing Unit. And this is the definition of a tensor. This is from mathworldswolfram.com. And it says an nth rank tensor is an m-dimensional space, is a mathematical object that has n indices and m to the power n components that obey certain transformation rules. So who in the audience understood this definition? All right, uh, those of you who understood, please explain to me after because I did not. So I'm gonna try to explain the definition a little bit in simpler form. So in the rank, when what we're talking about, that at rank zero, uh, a tensor basically is just a number. We all know numbers in programming or math. At rank one, it is an array or vector for math. At rank two, it's a 2D array, an array in an array. At rank two plus, they're generally just called the tensor. So tensor is the general term for any rank of matrices. And turns out in machine learning and when you're doing neural networks, most of the data is very well uh, presented in a tensor form. And a TensorFlow or libraries like PyTorch understands tensors and that's what they compute to figure out the next process in your neural network. So TPUs are generally designed to be really good at computing tensors. So a TPU is a matrix processor designed for neural network workload, a thousands of multipliers and adders connected together in what's called a systolic array architecture. What basically it means is it takes input in one end and it spits out two things. One is the multiplication of the previous two input and one is the summation that is continuously calculates. So it creates almost like a pipeline within your system to calculate the information that you're trying to calculate. So a TPU a host that is sending data to TPU will send a bunch of data to the TPU through the infeed queue and stored that in the high bandwidth memory inside the TPU. After calculation of is done, the outfit queue will then collect the information for using for later or using on a different infeed queue. 
To perform matrix operation, TPU loads the parameter from HBM into matrix multiplication units. Those are internal cores of TPU that does the calculation. So if you have some information like previously we had, instead of computing one at a time, we're gonna just load all the input parameters inside the TPU at the same time. So all the numbers get chunked out and sent to the TPU at the same time. That just happened there. In the next step, we load the data, the other, so that you had WX plus B, we just did the X, now we're gonna do the B, that we're gonna add to this TPU from the HBM. As each multiplication is executed, the result is passed to the next step. The output is the summation of all multiplication results, and during the whole process, the benefit of TPU in this case is that your machine is actually no longer going back to the memory to for the next instruction because everything was loaded in the beginning. So we have all of the numbers loaded up inside the TPU and the input parameters now all gets pushed into the TPU, calculated both the multiplication and summation at the same time. And the pipeline progresses until it reaches the end of your systolic array. And at the end, you can collect all the results at the same time. So because TPU does not have to go back and forth to the memory, it becomes a lot more efficient in terms of energy usage because it's not reading through the wire back and forth. So now let's talk about processing units that exist in the AIML space. The first one is CPU. CPU is kind of like the main unit of uh, compute for any kind of workload. And as Kathleen explained before, CPUs are just C groups and namespaces. Kubernetes does not really reinvent the wheel with containers. It just has APIs to talk to the underlying uh, run C and container runtime to talk to the container underneath. So if you looked at any Kubernetes YAML definition before, you have probably have seen some file like this. Uh, YAML is everybody's favorite. Yes, yes, yes. Everybody loves YAML. Uh, but in Kubernetes, we define this YAML to define our workload in this case. In this case, what we're looking at is this block of resource and request, which we have defined for memory, which is our RAM. We're not talking about that as a compute unit per se, but the thing we're interested in this case are CPUs. We're saying I need 250M CPU. What that means we're gonna talk about in a second. So if you want to know what happens when you click, like kubectl apply a particular uh, YAML file like this, if you go to our, sketch page, there is gonna be the PDF of the slides. You can click this link. It goes into a lot more detail exactly what happens, but the part we're interested in is how does Kubernetes then schedule our workload onto the hardware underneath? So when a new node gets attached to our Kubernetes cluster, it lets the kubelet know what kind of hardware, how much uh, CPU and memory it has available for doing work on it. API server then learns that information from our kubelet, and when a new workload comes, like a YAML file gets applied to our Kubernetes context, API server will talk to the scheduler, will ask, okay, I need 0.25 CPU, I need uh, two gigabytes of RAM, what do you have available that I can run this workload on? If the scheduler finds something, it will then create that pod onto the node. A pod is uh, multiple containers that have the same namespace for network and mount. So a pod is just an abstraction on a container. And once that starts, that process will then directly talk to the hardware onto the node and use the resources to run the workload you're trying to run. Now, when you say request and limit, basically what happens is, you, to Kubernetes API server, we ask, give me max of X, which is the limit, in Y, which is the request increment. If the scheduler can find a node with resources greater than request, it will schedule it on that node. If your pod asks for more while it's running, and if you have limit over that, it can restart the particular pod to start with more resources. And if it can't get any more in, uh, resources, it will fail. So if you have run Java workload ever on Kubernetes, you probably have seen this dreaded OM killed on your pod because it asked for more RAM and Kubernetes scheduler said, I can no longer give you any more RAM, so it gets out of memory killed. Now let's take a, like, a step back and think about what it means when you say something like 0.25 CPU. You can't really go to Best Buy or some hardware store and be like, I want a laptop with 11.5 CPU. That doesn't exist. Right? So in the world of Kubernetes, when you say something like, I want a fractional CPU, what that basically means is the scheduler and the uh, container runtime with C groups and namespaces is gonna limit that particular process from using more than 0.25 CPU cycle every second. So it is not necessarily saying I'm gonna chunk out and cut out 0.25 CPU to give to this process. If the process still runs on the entire node, 
is just a software level isolation that stops the same process from using more CPU cycle every second. So let's try to see that in action. And hopefully that will work. Okay. Ooh, reconnect. Conference Wi-Fi. That is not doing it. Fantastic. Oh, close. Welcome to the live de demo segment. <laughs> okay. So the code we're running here, it's fairly straightforward. But what we're trying to do here is I want to run uh, Go Routine is written in Go. Uh, but the main idea is I want to run this code in a thread that's going to do a bunch of calculation. It's just going to do a multiplication. And every time it does it, I'm going to count how many times I have done it. So if everything goes well at the end of this program running, which runs for about 10 seconds, I'm going to get a printout that says the calculation ran for 10 seconds, and it did that many counts of calculation. And what I have here is a Kubernetes, oh boy, okay, is a Kubernetes cluster that is made up of a bunch of node pools. Okay. And the node pools I have there are four different. I have an E2 standard, which happens to be general purpose uh, CPUs, has two CPU on this one, eight on this one, and 32 on this one. Okay? So I'm going to run the workload, kubectl. Oh, before I have to show the workload. So cat job one dot YAML. So the job itself, it says I have a node selector that selects the particular uh, node under target. And I have made the Go application that I had into a container image. And I'm giving it a request of 500 uh, millicore of CPU for each of the job that I'm running. And this is the same exact job definition that is targeting different uh, node types. OK. Okay, don't do live demos, people. <sighs> okay. You know what? I'm going to abandon that particular demo real quick. Don't worry, there's another one. <laughs> so I'm going to come back to that demo in a second. I'm going to continue on the other part, and we're going to get to that demo in a second. Um, so basically, what is supposed to happen, what we're going to show here is that when you run a workload on Kubernetes and that asks for how many uh, CPU I have in this particular node, even though you said we want to give it only like 0.1 CPU or 0.5 CPU, because it's running as a process onto the node itself, it will actually see all the CPUs that exist in that particular hardware. So what will end up happening is if I have a Go routine that says, okay, spin up as many Go routines as possible in this particular node, it will try to spin up that many like go routines but because i have a c group limit that says don't give this particular process more than 0.5 cpu your cpu kernel will constantly swap out your work every half a cycle so that even though you are supposed to get like all 32 you see all 32 cpu being available your workload does not actually get all 32 cpu it gets constantly swapped out so if you have workload that requires to have constant cpu workload you probably want to give it the full node. So if you have really CPU intensive workload, although a single node can run multiple pod, you probably want to get in the world of running a single pod per node when it requires the whole hardware underneath. Okay, so we'll come back and see what happened to the demo in a second, but CPUs are pretty well understood. Kubernetes understands CPU from the get-go because that's how Kubernetes processes run. But GPUs and TPUs and all the other PUs that can exist are not something that is available in every single node. So Kubernetes core does not and should not care about this other TPU, other PUs type, types. Oh, this is what is known as being out of tree for Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, if you go to the Kubernetes source code and search for GPU or TPU, you're not going to find anything. Now, how is then these things are found and used in Kubernetes? So scheduler needs to know which node has these processing units. A container runtime to be able to talk to this hardware. And finally, kubelet to know this quote-unquote general devices. 
If you want to learn more about how exactly this works, there is a great talk from last KubeCon from David, uh, I forget the other name, and the link is here. You can go take a look. They go in a lot more detail. And I think they're giving a second talk this conference, uh, even going further about devices. But in a nutshell, what basically happens is when you have GPU uh, drivers at the bottom here, um, and that GPU driver talks to something called device plugin. So these device plugins are something you are pro if you are a hardware provider, you will write yourself, and that can talk to then Kubelet, which will basically register itself as a named entity. In this case of a GPU driver, the name could be something like nvidia.com slash GPU. If it's an AMD device, it will have some different name, but most of the cases these days are NVIDIA, and the API server now knows there is a certain device called nvidia.com slash GPU. Now, when a new workload comes to the API server saying, I want some resources, API server now tells the scheduler that, okay, I know of a one node that has this NVIDIA.com GPU available. Scheduler then will create this pod onto that node, and the, uh, the pod will then talk to container runtime and run C to create containers onto the node. This container talks to the hardware directly because they're just processes running on that particular VM. So a lot of people have concern about using containers and Kubernetes for AML workload because they think they might lose out on some performance because they are going through some sort of virtualization. In reality, the performance difference between using a container versus directly talking to these devices, there shouldn't be any because containers are just processes that are talking directly to the hardware. So in the example we saw for CPUs, is the very same for GPUs and TPUs. You have resources that you can set with named entity. For example, for NVIDIA GPUs, these are just nvidia.com slash GPUs, and the number of GPUs you'd want. In this case, I want eight GPUs. You also have something called node selector that selects a particular node. This is to help the scheduler figure out which node it knows to have uh, the GPUs that we're looking for. And these labels are self created. So this is something either your cloud provider is attaching to the node pool or you yourself, if you know that that particular node has a particular GPU, you can add that yourself uh, for this. And the same thing for TPUs. The example is very similar where you have this google.com slash TPU and that's the name the uh, TPU driver is attaching itself with kubelet and you have the node uh, selected to do the same thing. So the second part of the demo, which, okay, great. Um, I'm going to have to go back. Okay, so I have this YAML definition of a TPU job, which is going to be something that runs a fine-tuning workload on a large language model. Uh, I'm going to try to kick this job off if it wants to work with me this time, but even if it doesn't, if you want to see how that is working, if you come by the Google booth, we have actually a couple of demos running on the screen of that same workload that we can show you how this actually works underneath. But another workload I'm running here is an inference workload, which is uh, serving a large language model to talk to. You can have examples of talking to Gemini or talking to ChatGPT. We have a very similar example running. So this is running an open model called Gemma. I'm going to just reload this, and I'm going to ask it a question. And it should probably know what is Kubernetes. It's a KubeCon, so if it doesn't know, we should teach it. But I ask it what is Kubernetes, and this is a very small model compared to the bigger ones, like a 2 billion parameter model. And it gave it back with something. And I'm going to ask it something uh, fun. Uh, write a poem about Kubernetes for its 10 year anniversary. And it's going to come back. So the way this is working is I have a pod running on my cluster. Hopefully it comes back. I have a pod running on my cluster. Ooh, OK. I, I can't tell if it's good or bad because I can't read all that that quickly, but it looks to be rhyming for the most part. So I'm going to guess it's good. Um, so what is happening here is I have a pod running on this cluster, kubectx GPU. I'm switching context and kubectl get PO. So I have this one pod, hopefully comes back, running in this cluster called TGI Gemma deployment, which has GPU attached, which loads up the memory, which loads the entire model onto GPU memory. And then I have a Gradio service that we are talking to to communicate and get information. So in terms of like talking to this uh, particular GPU-bound workload, the actual process of doing that is fairly similar to what we're already used to. We are setting up limits and resources and talking to GPU-bound workloads. Very similar way we can talk to CPU and memory-bound workload. With that, we're going to move on to 
Yes, sorry that the demo got a little bit away from you this time. Seems to be the way with live demos, right? But um, in general, the CPU's task is to write the code. The CPU runs and understands what you've written there, and then writing to memory and going through that with billions of, of transactions there. With the GPU, you can you know play a game with a smooth graphics and avatar generation, and all of that is really wonderful for generating those images. With repurposing that concept for machine learning, it's making the process a lot faster. And with that, on you know, machine learning on GP or on CPUs rather would be days uh, to process all of that with. This, it can go down to seconds, as you can see. So adding that TPU, it will be more of a specific use case, specific software, um, TensorFlow libraries, et cetera, that can be used in parallel. And so processing those texts will be a lot faster. So reasons you should use Kubernetes for AIML. Kubernetes, of course, generally uses containers, and containers are language and framework agnostic. They're just a process running on a machine, so whichever framework and language you use is fine. Containers, generally, and also Kubernetes are open source, which means that they can run on a wide variety of hardware and environments. And Kubernetes is meant to manage many machines. So when you have AI workloads, which sometimes need a whole lot of resources, and sometimes they don't need as much, they're very bursty, um, Kubernetes can be a really good way to make sure that you're using your resources efficiently. Yeah, we have so many varieties of hardware out there that could be used for very specific use cases, and a lot of times um, they can run parallel tasks. <laughs> For optimization of hardware and things like that, you're already running machine learning processes and it costs time and money. So the hardware can make that uh, reduce costs and reduce time efficiency and get those uh, products out to the market faster. So, you know, that's what we all want, right? Is to get everything faster and get the fast answer out there. So couple of tips and tricks for using CPU. So for critical batch worker, as I said before, oftentimes having that swaps in the process can be very costly. So if you're running a lot of batch workloads parallelly, you might want to run uh, one pod per node. So we have like customers that run all 5,000 node pods or even 15,000 node, node pods on GKE. Uh, and consider using CPUs with higher clock cycle for more demanding workloads. So the most basic CPU you can get from your cloud provider are probably the cheaper ones. That does pretty well for most kind of workloads. But if you want faster clock cycle, most cloud providers or even data centers can offer more expensive, faster clock cycle CPUs. And finally, number of ML workloads can offload to CPU and RAM. So if you are running a G GPU and TPU workload with a lot of memory and you give it like a less CPU, sometimes some of the libraries will want to use, offload some of the work, so you want to use that. Couple of the things for GPUs and TPUs is that label your nodes appropriately so that you can find them easily and use taints to stop from non-GPU TPU workload to be scheduled onto GPU TPU hardware because again, if you're using up that resource for non-ML workload, you're just wasting resources at that point. And if you're using a multi-node setup, if you want, to, you want to try to keep them as closely geographically located as possible. So either if, you, if it's your own data center, schedule them appropriately. If you are using a cloud provider, use their semantics to find out how to get them closer. And finally, using GPUs, they have things like multi-instance GPU, time slicing, and multi-process services to use the same GPU for more workload. So that leads us to, uh, we, I know we have a short amount of time left, but I'll try to condense this slide a little bit. So that leads us to the sustainability portion of things. So we want to be able to use, you know, I'm sure you've seen ARMS, the laptops are being used out in, um, you know, Apple M1, M2, and we've got uh, Google Chromebooks as well as, um, you know, service ARMS. So there's a lot of um, uh, um, benefit to that with our batteries lasting a lot longer. So we've got all of the cloud providers, you know, Amazon, Google, and other cl cloud providers out there that are working really hard to reduce that footprint, trying to go a little bit more carbon neutral. And so they're adding them to their pillars of well-architected frameworks and various things like that. Now Google, I know, has within their UI, you could pick a specific region to show you where it's more carbon neutral. So that's really nice. Um, and then, you know, this, this is kind of a, a lot of information here, but we probably have more and more 
APUs go, coming in the future. So this is just a slide kind of emphasizing that. Um, feel free to check that out later. So in review, this was a lot of information, and I know that you probably weren't able to consume all of it. <laughs> so if there are a few things that you take away, I hope that you learned that containers essentially are just C groups and namespaces and basically are just processes on uh, your machine. CPUs are great multi-purpose processors, while GPUs make processing power even stronger through parallelization. TPUs both do parallelization and they load in all of their instructions all at once to make them faster so that they're not going to memory as often. And through the power of device plugins, all of these accelerators can work with Kubernetes. Kubernetes doesn't add anything in between. It's just enabling you to make use of what's there with the applications that you're running. So with that, uh, that's going to be the end of the talk. Of course, provide your feedback if you want to. Uh, it's going to be on the same search page that you saw the talks in. And with that, I, do we have any time for questions? Not really, but I don't think so. there's nothing after this. So, so if you want to come. We're going to be hanging out here and outside if you have any more questions about a specific task. With that, thank you for coming to this talk. Thank you.